come to this uh, section of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, it's a really good opportunity to give space to think about what's really important in life, what do we look forward to putting back into life uh, when we are unpaused. I'm sure that you've read some of the essays that have been out online about what will life be like when we are unpaused, and it's interesting to think about what, what will we put back into our lives. We all know how to answer the question. Uh, We're going to put back into our schedules whatever it is that we believe will make us the most happy. That's the way we work as people. Uh, What makes our hearts happy is what we do. Uh, You know, what we are identifying most right now is the things that we miss will be the things that go right back into our schedule immediately, which is kind of obvious at one level, but it does raise the question, what kinds of things should make our hearts happy? What kinds of things should direct our living? It's really the question about what we think life is all about. It's the question about what we think God has made us for. And our spiritual forefathers answered this question with the famous words from our shorter catechism, which uh, hung on a banner in our worship center, asking, answering the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer to that simple catechism question is actually profound, that man's chief end, our primary goal for life, what life is all about, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Life is about living to bring glory to God. Not just by doing worship activities like we're doing this morning, uh, which are certainly important and necessary, but by doing everything in a way that brings glory to God. Making our work lives and our recreation lives, our student lives, our parenting lives, all as means of worshiping God and as means of enjoying God. That's what we're made to do. We're made to worship God and we're made to to enjoy God. And of course, we understand from the the Bible's report that sin frustrates this purposeful living, that as Paul identifies in verse 21 of the reading, what I inherit from Adam, who is the first and representative human from which all humans physically and spiritually descend, what I inherit from him is a sinful nature and death, which is some inheritance. It's a sobering inheritance to consider that I'm not born spiritually neutral, that I'm not born uh, neutral towards God, but that I'm born spiritually estranged from God, believing really that my chief end in life is to glorify me and to do what I enjoy for my own pleasure above all. But not forever, because what I inherit from Adam is the eventuality of, spirit, of physical death even as an outcome of spiritual death. That's the bad news. And the, the good news is wrapped all through what we celebrated last weekend through the events of Good Friday and of Easter Sunday and indeed what we celebrate every morning of every day and uh, throughout each day is that God the Father sent another representative, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus, so that the reality of verse 22 becomes our reality. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The all being conditioned by verse 23, all who belong to Christ. And here's the emphatic point that God may be all in all. That God may be all in all. That every hindrance of my sin and my natural self-centeredness and of God's justice, which must punish sin and consequent death and the many pathways towards death, uh, however it comes in our lives, that all of these things are removed. And that's what verse 28 is about, how the historic Easter, Christ's new life, brings us forward towards this final goal. What makes all of the events of Good Friday and Easter and all the promises they secure good news is that they lead us to God. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us near to God. And When we get there, it is God himself who will satisfy our souls forever. Everything else in the gospel is meant to display God's glory and remove every obstacle to himself, such as his wrath, or in us, such as our rebellion, so that we can enjoy him forever. God is the final and highest gift that makes the good news good. And I want to underscore that as we move into understanding the rest of this passage, because 
what Piper is saying, which is what Paul says in verse 28, is that after all of the different mechanics of the gospel, all of the different achievements of Jesus, all of the different realities of justification and forgiveness and adoption into God's family and sanctification and the Spirit's ongoing transformation of us and our eventual glorification to be with the Lord in heaven and then uh, on the new earth in the future, that all of these things go in the direction of the final goal, which is that God is all and in all and that we receive this relationship with God unhindered, that, that God himself is the good news of the gospel. And that's what Paul puts in the middle of this passage on resurrection in verse 28. And so my goal is to show from verses 20 to 34 how Christ Jesus' new life secures that good news for us. So the first point is that our real future is secured within Christ's new life. Let's look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. And I choose the word within Christ's new life to attempt to capture what Paul means by using the important word first fruits to describe Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection, a past event, even for these Corinthian readers, means that for a Christian's future, Paul could have said that Christ was the first of those who'd fallen asleep, but he uses the word first fruits because he wants to teach us an important lesson. And the lesson is, is not simply about chronology, but about connectiveness, about togetherness. Here's why. In the Old Testament, the first fruits were the sacrificial offerings brought by God's people in worship. For example, we read in Deuteronomy 18, the first fruits of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep you shall give to him. The first fruits offerings represented the entire harvest that was being offered to God, one representative part of the whole harvest to which the first fruit is organically connected. It's the organic connection that makes the use of the term important because first fruits is not simply, as one commentator put it, an indication of temporal priority. It's not only about sequence that Christ was raised first, but rather it brings into view Christ's resurrection as the first fruits of an entire harvest, the initial portion of the whole. The resurrection is the representative beginning of the resurrection of believers. In other words, when Christ was raised from death to life, and you have the initial resurrection, that puts into sequence, as we will see, all of the new lives of everyone who is organically connected to Christ. We call this, in short term, union with Christ, and this has at least two applications. First, Christ's resurrection as first fruits secures the Christian's resurrection as certain. Try it this way. If you're a Christian, Easter means not just that you will be raised, but it means that Easter is the start of the resurrection process. As surely as the the first new blade of grass pokes up through the ground in springtime, proving that many more blades will shortly follow, Christ's resurrection, uh, breaking through the hard soil of death, if you will, newly alive, proves that other shoots of new life, where the new lives of every Christian, are right behind. So there's an idea of certainty tied into the idea of first fruits. But secondly... Uh, there's a picture of what resurrection life will look like. Now, we'll have more on this next week, Lord willing, because Paul makes a lot more about this later on in the chapter to encourage us. But it is fair to see when Paul uses the idea of first fruits here, he's saying that you can look at, at Christ as a farmer might look at his or her harvest and the first fruits of the harvest and say that if this is what the first fruits look like, This is what the rest of the harvest is going to look like. And we can learn about what our resurrection life will look like when we look at Christ's. It will be bodily, physical, knowable, relatable, enjoyable. A resurrected me that is identifiable with the the me that walked around during this period of history. And this is an amazing hope. Paul says that this, this is the hope that belongs to every Christian. Again, in verse 21, Paul reminds everyone that we all share in a common spiritual condition that we inherit from Adam. 
but that every Christian shares in a common spiritual condition that we inherit from Christ, the condition of aliveness, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, if you were uh, attending at all during our study of 1 Corinthians, you know that the Corinthian community, like every other human community, had lots of different ways of dividing people one from another. That, that there was a challenge with the people who had more were dividing from the people who had less, and that, that there were people who were uh, the few number of actually free people were dividing from the much greater number of people who were in some estate of slavery in the Roman Empire, and uh, that there were people who were followers of one preacher were dividing from followers of another preacher, and all the different kinds of ways that humans can find to divide from each other. But Paul, what Paul is saying here is that at the end of the day, the factualness of Christ's resurrection means that there really are just two types of people, those who are dead in Adam and those who are alive in Christ, which begs the question, how are you identified? Who secures your future? Is your future secured by Adam? That would not be a good future to have. Or is your future secured by Christ? Christ is the first fruits, and our new life is found within him. But then secondly, Paul talks about our, our real future, and he does here talk about sequence in verses 23 to 25, each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And what Paul needs to explain to the church is the apparent pause in time between Christ's resurrection to new life and our eventual resurrection to new life. That Christ has already on the historic Easter Sunday been raised. He is already alive as the first fruits and that there will be a future moment when all Christian believers will be raised. And Paul wants us to see that this time between resurrections, a time that feels like a long period of time to us, some thousands of years now at this point, is intentional. And so he answers the question, what is happening between Christ's resurrection and his final return and our resurrection as believers? Well, what's happening is Christ as king is defeating every force of spiritual opposition, that Christ is today from heaven reigning and defeating his enemies. And the reference that Paul makes to putting all enemies under his feet is actually a reference to two different psalms, to Psalm 8 and to Psalm 110. Psalm 8 is about God's unique commission of humanity to bear God's image and to take care of creation. The beginning of the psalm might sound familiar to you. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then in verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. And then in verse 6, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. So Psalm 8 is about humanity's commission to take care of creation. But Psalm 110 narrows the vision. Psalm 110 puts the focus not on mankind generally, but on one man, on God's king who will come with the mission of defeating God's enemies. Psalm 110 and verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 110, if we were to further explore it, is about a king who comes, who also acts like a priest and defeats the Lord's enemies. And Paul is saying that Jesus is that king. He is the king of Israel, but he is also a priest crucified, and he is as God's final king and as God's final priest, now ruling and conquering and defeating those who are opposed to God. So it's interesting to think about how is he doing that? How is Christ defeating God's spiritual adversaries? And Paul actually tells us how in verses from uh, earlier in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes this. 
if starting in verse 6. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The doomed rulers of this age are shown at Christ's empty tomb from Easter Sunday onward that they are perpetually defeated. But here's the the applicatory part for us, that when you and I share this gospel, the gospel of Christ come and crucified and risen and reigning, And when we share it with friends who come to believe in the gospel, whether we're sharing it individually with our neighborhood friends or our workplace friends or we're sharing it with our children or we're sharing it uh, with those out in our community, as we share the gospel, whether it's in a formal venue like preaching a sermon or in a very informal venue, however it is that we share the gospel, the Holy Spirit takes the shared gospel and he applies it to people who become believers so that each new Christian experiences death as itself a defeated enemy. Jesus is doing that right now. In other words, how Christ is defeating the enemies of God is through the proclamation of the gospel. That as the gospel goes out across time and over the earth, Christ is reigning and he is defeating death until such time, verse 26, as the last enemy to be destroyed is death. I think it's a really compelling thought for you and I as we think about at least part of what is our life about, what are we here for, that when we share the gospel with people, we're pushing back against the king's enemies. That to do this at children's ministry, to do this at vacation Bible school, to do this in all the different ways which we have done and which, Lord willing, we'll be able to do again, all of these ways are ways that we can push back on the enemies of God, the spiritual opponents of God. What a great opportunity for us during this global conversation uh, about disease and what's happening. And all of those different moments where we might have conversations where nature seems to be out of control and that death seems to be undefeatable. To be able to say, look, could I talk to you about what the king has done? Could I talk to you about the fact that he's defeated death? Could I talk to you about the moment that is yet in the future where death, the last enemy, will be destroyed? Yes, grief is real. Yes, there are deaths to lament. There are dreams which are broken. Yes, it's appropriate to identify what really hurts. But it's also appropriate to say that God hasn't made it to be this way, and it isn't going to stay this way. That the king has conquered. That the king is reigning. That he's secured the final victory. That he has risen. And when he returns, in sequence, the believer's will rise. And until then, thirdly, we're sustained by God's king for God's glory. So verse 27 again connects to Psalm 110. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. What's plain? Because it doesn't necessarily seem plain to me. But what's plain is the missional relationship between God the Father and God the Son. The Father sends the Son as prophet, priest, and king to conquer, to preach the gospel, to be the mediator between heaven and the church. But of course the Son, as he moves and as he conquers sin, he can't conquer God the Father. That's the point that Paul is making, that the Son serves out of pleasure to the Father. But the Son's saving mission does come to an end, verse 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and in all. And there's our goal verse. That's where this is going, that God will be all and in all. And verse 28 in the the history of the church has unnecessarily launched heresies that we don't need to worry about today, but heresies with respect to what's the Son's relationship to the Father and what does it mean for the Son to be in subjection to the Father. But Paul's point, I think, is more plain. He's saying that when the Son, as a function of his kingship, completes putting all of his enemies under his feet, including death, he subjects himself to the Father, 
who had put all things in subjection to Christ the King. In other words, the Father commissioned the Son to go and do a work. The Son went and did the work, conquering sin and bringing death to death. And after the Son completes the mission, he comes back to the Father and he says, essentially, mission accomplished. He doesn't stop being the Son. He remains the Son, equal in power and glory with the Father. But the nature of his mission has changed because once death is completely vanquished, there's nothing left for the king to conquer. Christ doesn't stop being the king either in his exaltation, but he moves, if you will, from being a warrior king to a victorious king. And the king victorious completes his mission with the result that God is all and in all, that every hindrance to fellowship with his people is removed, every consequence of sin dealt with, so that God gets all the glory and we can have an unhindered, uninterrupted relationship with him. And if you are in Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, Christ is the first fruits that tells you that this will be your future. That you will be sustained by God's king for God's glory unto that day. And then in verses 29 to 34, Paul simply wants Christians to apply the implications of Jesus' resurrection to everyday life. You could consider verses 29 to 34 an interlude for application. There's a very confusing verse, verse 29. I don't know if you caught it when Stephanie read it. Otherwise, what do people mean, Paul asks, by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? This is an obscure verse. Commentators don't know what to do with this because we're not exactly sure what the Corinthians were doing. And Paul's not commending that this should be done as a practice in the church. There's no teaching in the New Testament that suggests that Christians should do this. What Paul is simply doing is he's pointing out a logical inconsistency, that they were doing something with baptism, kind of living people on behalf of dead people. And Paul's saying, if you don't believe that there's a resurrection, why are you doing that? It's logically inconsistent. No resurrection, dead people just stay dead. But because Christ is raised, gospel courage does make sense. Gospel courage to carry the gospel out into the world. And this, Paul, wants to be, I think, the application of the church, starting in verse 30. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. In other words, every day of ministry is a challenging day for Paul, that he puts his life on the line every day to share the gospel of Jesus. What do I gain, Paul asks, if humanly speaking I fought with the beasts at Ephesus? If I, if I was tossed into the arena uh, to be a martyr in front of the lions? If the dead are not raised, why would I do that? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And then he says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Now, the bad company that Paul has in mind are the the bad company of the Corinthian Christians who are denying the resurrection. That's the bad company that he doesn't want to corrupt the church. He's saying that the resurrection deniers need to be avoided. Because if Christ is raised from the dead, then the So-called risks, which aren't really risks, of life and limb and money, spending time, orienting talent toward sharing the gospel, these things are not foolish because Christ is raised. Making sacrifices for the advance of the kingdom unto the day when God is all and in all is entirely reasonable, entirely logical. It, uh, it reminds me of Jim Elliott's short but famous logic that launched several generations of missionaries and campus ministers and pastors. When Elliott, uh, martyred by the Aka Indians, uh, had uh, written down simply, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's the logic that Paul wants the church to put into practice. That if Christ is raised, you've been given a future that you cannot lose. And so anything that you would do to advance the gospel is not wasted. Anything that you would do in order to tell others about Jesus is not actually foolish, but wise. Because at the end of the day, there are just two kinds of people. At the end of the day, there are just two kinds of outcomes of life. 
Christ, our first fruits, has secured a new life for all of his people unto the day when every hindrance towards being with God is removed, death is destroyed, God is all and in all, and we come into the, to the greatness of his presence. The final question lands, if there are two kinds of people and two kinds of outcomes, what about you? What about me? What are the outcomes of our life in Christ or apart from Christ? Well, as we pray, let me invite you to think about that. And let me give you an opportunity to talk to Jesus about what it means to follow after him from your own perspective, from within the story of your own life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it is amazing to think that you as first fruits of the resurrection have already broken through death and that you've secured that for your people. We're really, really grateful to know that. And we're grateful to know how it is that you overcome your enemies through the sharing of the gospel. We pray that you would help us to be able to do that more and better in our own lives as your spirit empowers us. But above all, Lord, I, I pray that we would know which of the two kinds of people we are. Are we still in Adam or are we alive in Christ? And I pray that you would grant us the gift of faith, maybe even for the first time today, watching or listening to this sermon, that you would grant that gift of faith uh, by which you unite us to Jesus who is risen and that you secure us for that great future when you, Heavenly Father, will be all and in all. We pray that you would do that even today. We pray that you do that for your glory. Amen.